We move for our women's panel, I believe. Give a hand, our executive director, to be the last. Let, let me emphasize that she comes tomorrow, 11 o'clock, Crampton on the turn. That's where we're going to do the televised breakdown or conclusion of all that we're doing. Everybody, be there, bring your children, Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. I got that from Senator Larry Young, who's in the back. He was ill, but he has risen like he said. Walking Easter, Larry Young. Reverend Charles Williams, Detroit. See a lot of our chapter leaders. Don't forget Crampton Auditorium tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock. How many of y'all gonna meet me there? All right. If you don't, your arm will hurt all day, the one you raised up. <laughs> Ms. Ford, I'm so excited to see you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So we've been getting a lot of information in here today, haven't we? It's been great. It's been great. We've been joined by really strong personalities. Our media panel this morning was excellent. We really have learned a lot of uh, good and bad. We kind of have, have been able to get some good information that we need. Um, and I think the most important message was that it's in our hand. Media has changed. We no longer need to do some of the same old things in order to get messages out. So that is, has really been very, very informational. We are now going to be joined by some of the women for our women's panel. I see some folks who are walking out, and I hope you're just going to take a bathroom break and be right back. So we're going to bring the other young ladies into the room, and we're going to be having a conversation about women's issues. So we really uh, wanted to make sure that it is an intergenerational conversation with your multiple women and interracial conversation, because we know that the assaults on women are not just for black, Hispanic, or any one race. We have issues that are facing all women. And we want to make sure um, that we spend some time today covering those issues. Now, there are folks who are sitting in the back two rows of the room, and we're going to ask that you all move up, please, so that we are tight and we can really have a good conversation. So we ask that everybody's in the back two rows, would you please move up and tighten in with us. Get everyone to tighten up and please take your seats.
Cornelius to be with us as she was this week. Uh, Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis as she was with us this week. Uh, we started on Wednesday morning with the United States Attorney General uh, Eric Holder who was here and discussed the issue of Trayvon Martin. So unless you are in the room, one, you wouldn't know that it was happening and he had to, that he actually addressed that issue at the session and then folks go around and say, and nobody's saying anything from the Obama administration and they're not talking about it, but you gotta be present when these folks come to these types of uh, addresses so that you know exactly what they're saying and so that you can be empowered to go back to your communities with the information because you are privileged to be in a place that other folks can't be, be at. And so we, we really encourage you to continue to be with us throughout this convention and to understand that we do this so that we bring the policy makers, the decision makers, and the most influential folks to the people. Our convention is free to the public. And we do that every year because we want to make sure that you have no excuse, no reason for why you can't be with us. We make sure that it is a free convention and we bring some of the most influential people and some folks who sit in very high seats um, so that they know that the people do care about the issues and you must be uh, present in order for them to understand that pressure. And so again, I thank you all because you are the privileged folks who have been with us, but it is because of your support and because of your partnership that we are able to do what we do within the National Action Network. So thank you all. We wanted on this schedule this week to be sure to address the issue of women. We know that there is an assault on women's rights happening all over this country, but all over the world. There are assaults on women's rights, and we have never, as women, been able to truly realize our dreams and, and to truly become, uh, have a seat at the table. And there are many that are breaking down barriers, but as you all know, it is a hard job, and it takes thought-provoking conversation, it takes partnerships, it takes us helping one another and sort of being a lending hand. And so we wanted to have this conversation today. Many people say there's got to, we got to have panels that talk about the solutions. We all know the problems, but we got to talk about solutions. And I would submit to you today that before we can talk about solutions, we need to talk about the action plan. Because you can't get to a solution until you put together a plan that how can we all be supportive of one another in the work that you are doing. You know, Reverend Sharpton always talks about people need to stay in their lane. Stay in your lane and do what it is that you do. And if you're good at what you're doing and I'm good at what I'm doing, then we are going somewhere. We're making progress. And so that is the reason why we wanted to have this panel today. And there's a lot of folks up here and a lot more to come because there's a lot of voices that we need to hear from. People are active in their communities. People are organizing. People are doing a lot of different things. And the solution is in the room. So we need to hear from those folks who are out there every day as the trailblazers and figure out how it, we can be supportive and what are the issues that they are directly addressing that we believe in and we want to work with them on it. And so we brought these folks here today so we can talk about it in that context and really have an action plan for how we will move forward. We also wanted to have an interracial conversation because it is not enough to just have a conversation all the time, which sometimes we do need to have the black women's round table to discuss our issues from a black woman's standpoint. But then sometimes we've got to have a conversation that is broader. What is happening with women in general in this country and how can we be supportive? Because if, there, if Planned Parenthood does no longer exist, it does not just affect black women, although of course we have major issues, health disparities, and we need them addressed and Planned Parenthood has been there to do that. But at the same time, there are other races, other women that go to Planned Parenthood as well. So how do we join forces to ensure that Planned Parenthood keeps its funding and that other uh, things that we need to get from the administration, the Obama administration, and all government officials and all of the social services organizations that they are servicing all of us. Because if all of us are healthy, healthy, and all of us have what we need and there's justice for all of us, then we are a better nation and women will be better and, and, and stronger. And so again, we wanted to have an interracial conversation. But then we wanted to have an intergenerational conversation because the issues are not just about older women or younger women. How can we all be supportive of one another? We can learn from 
one another. Younger women have something to bring to the table. Older women have the history that is so important, and we need that information because we cannot move unless we understand where we have been. And so all of those things are up here on this panel, and we want all of you to leave here empowered to do great work. I was asked, um, I've been asked by Melanie Campbell on many occasions uh, to be with her on different panels and topics, and she sends out information on women in general. Melanie Campbell is uh, the president and CEO of the national, I want to make sure that I say it right, is the national coalition on black civic in participation, okay? But she also does the Black Women's Roundtable, which I have been involved in on many occasions. And Melanie brings together a stellar group of women whenever she calls out, because people know that she's serious about empowering women. So I went to her to ask her to be the co-convener of this occasion, because we could not come to DC or do anything else across this country that has to do with women without going to someone who is a leader in this area and who continuously brings together all of the thought leaders to really have an action plan, again, for where, how we are going to move. So I'm going to ask Melanie to say a brief word. We have someone with us who must go and is, is helpful, is being helpful today uh, by staying for two panels, Mia Malika Henderson from the Washington Post. Um, she was on the media panel uh, and it has now stayed to be a part of the political conversation on this panel. And so we don't want to take up too much time from Mia Malika, but we want to make sure that our co-convener has a few moments to speak to us to let us know why we've all been called here and to give us our task for what we should be listening for in this session. But then when we leave here, what is it that we need to do? So let me bring to you now Melanie Campbell, my sister, who is the co-convener of this conversation. And as a good co-convener, I have little to say, first of all. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, Tamika and her leadership here at the National Action Network and uh, one of her uh, great uh, cohorts, uh, Janae, and for all you do, and of course, Reverend Sharpton, and all of you all for the leadership is in this room, not here, not there, but we are. We are the leadership we're looking for. Um, so uh, the one thing that, um, that I think that's very, very critical it's just to understand the power of women uh, and how important relationships are and how important relationships matter because we were talking about it and about the issue very much on a lot of our minds over the last few weeks uh, around what happened with Trayvon and, and uh, his memory and the legacy of that and the reality is are we in a moment or are we in a movement? And I keep asking that question so that as we focus, we know that. But the, the fact that there has been an arrest does not stop there. That's a moment. We go, oh, okay, that's done. Let's move to the next thing. No, a movement is sustainable. It's sustained. And there's never what you call the movement is now over because we've all solved all the problems. Because there's always going to be folks out here who want to make sure that they exclude as opposed to being inclusive. And as women, we, it's an awesome task to have this conversation. And I love the idea of this is a conversation with women and with our brothers. And that's very, very much about what this conversation is. Our issues, your issues are our issues, our issues are your issues. And so I'm really glad to be here. And of course, we're going to talk about the power, power, power of the sister vote and also issues of social uh, um, uh, engagement. So I look forward to the conversation. Uh, and I'm going to just stop there and let's get the conversation going. And that's what we want to be, a conversation around solutions. And I thank everyone for uh, responding and being here. Uh, and like Reverend Chop said, also tomorrow, I just got to make that plug. We don't have a flyer about the conversation tomorrow. We want to show, I know we all busy on Saturday. We all got a lot but take a few hours, because they're going to have Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin there. They're going to have Kanyato Diallo, mother of Amadou Diallo, Nicole Bell, widow of Sean Bell, and the sisters and brothers. Just take the time to make sure that we show that we know what a movement is. And a movement is find us out, collect information, put the word out, get it out, and be there at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. So this conversation that we're starting today will all go on into tomorrow. Thank you. Washington Post and a regular contributor on Reverend Al Sharpton's TV show on MSNBC. Yeah. 
Politics Nation. She, she is in the forefront of bringing relevant political issues to the mainstream, and we are, are so proud to have her to be here with us and so appreciative that she decided to stay to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much, Malika, Mia, Malika, and Um, I will say I obviously cover politics, so this is is you know law for me to be here to talk about politics and talk about politics in front of real people. I often don't get a chance to do that. I'm often on a plane somewhere covering uh, a campaign or a candidate, and it's a very busy uh, world. And oftentimes you're in a bubble, and you don't always get a chance to, to talk to people and, and meet people and, and hear uh, what the real issues of the day are. I want to start. Uh, by introducing the panel. We don't have name tags up here, but can you just raise your hand uh, when I when I call out your name so folks out here will know who you are. Uh, first up, uh, Stephanie Brown, who's the National Director of the African American Vote for Obama for America. Okay. And we have uh, Gloria Chan, who is President and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute of Congressional Studies. Dr. Avis Jones DeWeaver, who is the Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, and we have Chanel Hardy, who is the Senior Vice President for Policy for the National Urban Women Policy Institute. And Alay Kenny, who is a Fellow uh, at the Youth and Young Adult Initiative at Negro. Carol McDonald, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships. And Terry O'Neill, who's the president of NOW, the National Organization for Women. And so in, in covering politics and covering these campaigns, I was just uh, in Providence, Rhode, Rhode Island, with Mitt Romney. And one of the things that's apparent, I think, in covering uh, this uh, campaign season, election 2012, is that women are going to be front and center in terms of uh, a voting bloc that is key uh, to winning this campaign in, in, in November 2012 for Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, and they are very much in the process of courting uh, the women's vote. So I want to ask the panelists, and you want to just start down here, what does it mean, what does this moment mean for women that they are going to be front and center, uh, front and center to this campaign? absolutely critical moment and what I find very interesting about what we're seeing right now is that we're having people banter about and point the finger in terms of this phrase war on women and so I want to take a minute to sort of remind us of where we started with this war on women you might recall back in 2010 when this new Congress was put in place uh, many of those people who won uh, ran on this platform of reducing the deficit making all sorts of fiscal decisions. Yet the first thing that they seem to be fixated on once they took their seats were absolutely decimating Planned Parenthood. Let's not forget about that. That was their first priority. Then since that time, we have seen states across this nation pass some 135 different laws, all aimed at restricting the rights of women to have dominion over their own bodies. That's the next thing that we've seen. We've seen everything from personhood amendments to calls for transvaginal ultrasounds, actual invasion of women's bodies. We've seen everything from attacks on contraception, something that I thought we would had been passed many, many years ago. Personal attacks on women who have the, the actual courage to speak up on their behalf, like we saw Rush Limbaugh do in terms of personally attacking individuals. We also have seen the sort of unprecedented uh, lack of conciliation on the Violence Against Women Act. This was something that was historically bipartisan, but all of a sudden we can't reach agreement in that direction. We've seen actual an attempt to redefine rape in the House of Representatives. 
So let's not forget what we're talking about when we're talking about a war on women. And then to have uh, you know, a presidential candidate have the audacity to sit here and say, well, the real war on women is that women aren't getting jobs. Where have you been for the past several years? Do you know nothing about the Great Recession, the Great Man Session? Let's be factual, okay? And so I just want to sort of put this into context. What we have happening right now is the realization that chickens will come home to roost come November 4th. The realization that women make up the majority of the voters in this nation, and the realization that they are 20 points behind in polls as it, as it comes to the women's vote. So let's not be man losers when it talks about women having the luxury to choose to stay home with their children. Let's be very real about what's going on, and it's about making sure that all of us have the right to have dominion over our bodies, and at the same time, have the financial freedom to be able to make whatever choices we want to make in terms of our mothering decisions. So, to further comment on the context she just laid, um, the war on women, you see the very overt, you see uh, issues with Planned Parenthood, you see issues with control, with the choice, the, the decisions and choices that women make, right? But you don't see the suburb where you hear, you know, talk about budget cuts, talk about cutting these, you know, unnecessary federal jobs. Well, those unnecessary federal jobs are typically positions held by women and women of color. So while you're, if they're out here talking, you need budget cuts. We don't need these, you know, specific divisions. We need to get rid of a lot of that, but we're get, getting rid of positions that we failed. So for young women, particularly because that's that's my area, that's who I speak for, you're looking at a climate that is just completely anti-you. So economically, it's anti-you because we want to close off avenues for your employment. You know, we want to close out level, low-level, entry-level federal jobs, which is what a lot of young black people after getting degrees go into to get their footing and then develop themselves to further go on into the corporate world, right? So the war on women is, is on so many different fronts that, you know, they try to kind of cloud it and confuse it with the, the major Planned Parenthood discussion, but not ever really articulate or, or get to a point where we actually talk about, we're going to actually attack you where it hurts the most, in your pockets, because we know that once we take this money out of your pocket, you can't then take it and go put it back into something that is actually going to destroy the structure and foundation that we put in place to inhibit you. So it's not just a warm woman in the overt sense, it's the very covert things of having these small legislations that are passed just local community states that are getting rid of jobs and positions, getting rid of your ability to make choices, just starting out out the gate. If you look at the number of young women that start out their lives in extreme amounts of debt, just trying to get an education. There's so many different ways. They're constantly putting pressure and making it a war that we're not even kind of addressing. We address Planned Parenthood, but are we addressing the fact that we don't necessarily have programs that go you know, specifically into our communities to address the education of young black women, right? So there are things that are very overt, very out there, very in your face, but they're the small things, the behind the scenes things that they think we don't notice, but we do. And those things are gonna really come to light because the one thing I've noticed about young women is that they're extremely engaged. I went to the bank to cash my check, and she says, oh, you work for the National Coalition? I'm volunteering at an organization trying to get young Latino women out to vote. Give me your number. And she's at work as a teller. It took that five minutes outside of her job you know, to take that risk and get my contact information to make that connection because it's that important to her and she's my age. So we're very serious. And we don't necessarily have to be overt about being serious because you'll see, we'll get it done. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gloria Chan. I'm with APAX. And I want to start by taking a, a step back further and just talk about the importance of multiracial coalition building and working together as, a, as a, all of our communities working together for a longer term vision of where, what it means for us to be Americans, you know, what type of democracy do we want to live in, um, and what it is to have strong, uh, vibrant communities throughout the country, what, what, no matter what color we are. Um, just a note on the history of our community, I'm speaking obviously specifically uh, to the African American and Asian American communities working together hand in hand throughout the years. And I want to cite you know, uh, legendary leaders like Yuri Kochiyama, who uh, worked hand in hand with uh, Malcolm X during the civil rights movements, 
um, to um, our leaders, Patsy Mink, the first woman of color elected of the U.S. You know, Patsy Mink's um, legendary work in terms of working together with the Congressional Black Caucus. She was one of the founding members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. There has been so much um, unity, coalition building, collaboration between our two communities. And it feels really awkward to, to speak on behalf of an Asian Pacific American community up here, but I understand that that's sort of what I'm here to do. Um, but to you know to really acknowledge the fact that we've had tremendous collaboration throughout the years. Um, before my post here at the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, um, I was the executive director of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus on the Hill. We worked so closely together with uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucuses and the Hispanic Caucuses, and together. Um, you know, but currently, obviously, we're in a nonpartisan organization, but the uh, 41 members of the K of KPAC are Democratic, um, and many of the members of the Black Caucus and Hispanic Caucus are so too. And so the power of that uh, collaboration is that um, close to 40% of the House Democratic Caucus are made of members of, um, members of Congress who are minorities. So if you just take a moment to think about that and how powerful that is, what happens when our agendas um, meld together. And that's another um, uh, point that I want to make is that a lot of people don't think, I'm, I'm just speaking, you know, if you're, if you're an African American or an Hispanic American, you're not going to think, oh, what are the policy priorities of all of our communities and does it make sense? But when I was working on the Hill, every single issue was the same. You know, there was health disparities in our, you know, a lot of people think Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, they're doing well. You know, they're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and we don't need to take care of them. Um, but there are so many, dis there are health disparities, there's educational disparities, where some of our communities are lagging behind. Um, the poverty issues, of course. I mean, every, on every single domestic issue, we were, uh, the KPAC was hand in hand with the Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus. So I want to, um, you know, frame that in a way of not only have our communities worked together in the past, um, but the policy issues are all the same. Um, and finally, the, the racism that our community face, faces is all the same. And look, just looking at the Trayvon Martin case, um, there's such incredible uh, media attention and outrage and outcry about this case. Um, and this is not only something that the African American community faces. There, you know, we are 30 years after Vincent Chin was beaten to death. Um, by auto, you know, auto workers who were laid off in, in, uh, in Detroit. And um, the two white men who beat him to death uh, were sentenced with, I think it was community service. It's like a few weeks of community service. who beat him to death with that, his skull was cracked open. Um, and so out of that case came the Asian American movement. It's when everyone you know, really saw um, each other as part of a larger community. So there are so many similarities of you know what our families face, what our communities face. Um, the, the story of race in this country is not an easy one to talk about. You know we are also 20 years um, after the LA riots, and we all know um, how much uh, how much hurt, how much pain and hurt came from both communities, the African American community as well as the Korean American community. But if we can think of how much positivity also came out of um, out of that situation throughout the country? Um, you know, my, my friend Mark Keem, who's a Virginia uh, delegate, um, just wrote an op-ed about the wonderful collaborations that happened throughout the country: Chicago, New York, D.C., L.A. About how closely Korean American communities and the African American community started working together to build racial healing. Um, today, that's no different. And, you know, with the Marianne Barry comments here in D.C., it continues. Um, and what it really comes down to, the solutions portion of it for me, is that leadership happens person to person. We need to understand each other's stories. You know, there's so many times where even within ethnic communities, we don't really listen to each other. How important is that? You know, if, and there's so and it's. Um, so many shared stories. Our families all struggle the same way. We have, you know, my parents had to had to put food on the table just the same. 
you know, they have the stress of balancing different jobs, you know, paying rent, it's all the same. So if we just take some time to listen to those stories, especially on a leadership level, um, and this is my commitment um, as president and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, we do national leadership trainings for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, both nationally and on the ground to encourage people to um, step up and take leadership roles, to run for office, to seek commission appointments, and how important is that um, for our leadership to really look at those uh, interracial collaborations. So my commitment really is to start partnering more. I started in this position about a year ago, um, and I really want to build those local partnerships on the ground where, um, you know, we, we just did a, a training in New Orleans, and um, it was a you know, predominantly Asian American uh, audience, but we included uh, members of the local African American leaders, and, you know, leaders who were organizing our communities on the ground. We had a Nicaraguan um, American woman there as well, and it was so powerful just to learn about each other um, and share those stories because they're going to be the future, and they're going to be, you know, members of Congress. You know, give them ten years, and they'll be running the show here. So I'm here to work together. I'm excited um, about growing our country and making it stronger. And thank you for having me. I'm Terry O'Neill, I'm president of the National Organization for Women, and I just want to um, uh, talk a little bit, as Avis talked about how uh, the Republicans are now saying war on women. What war on women? Why, that's just manufactured. Women care more about the economy than they care about birth control. You know, those Democrats have to stop talking about this war on women. Okay, <coughs> let's keep some numbers in our minds for a moment. As a result of the uh, great Recession, brought about by the disastrous tax breaks uh, by the Bush administration for millionaires and billionaires, combined with uh, fighting wars that were not paid for, um, and then not regulating the banks and the investment houses so that they drove the economy off a cliff. Right? As a result of all of that, we saw housing values plummet, and people lost their jobs. Right? Here are the numbers I want you to have in mind. Um, when you talk about women's net worth, right, or women, women's, women's net worth um, and the median net worth, half of the women in this country have a net worth above this number and half have a median, have, have a net worth below this number. Net worth is just how much you own <coughs> and take away how much you owe. All right. African American women, net worth, 18 years and older, single women, unmarried, $100. Latinas, 18 years and older, unmarried, $125. Net worth. White women, $41,500. Now that is a disparity that every policymaker in this town should be standing on the rooftops and screaming their lungs out about. And where are the Republicans that are now complaining? There's no war against women. $100? Net worth is not a war against women? Are you kidding me? Let's just compare that now to, uh, to couples. African American couples' net worth, uh, the median net worth, uh, was $35,000. By the way, these are 2009 numbers. These are numbers that really, right as soon as the, the, the really capture the impact of the Great Recession. $35,000. Latino community, in the Latino community, couple, uh, couples' uh, net worth median was about $18,500. White couples, $167,000. Now, these are disparities that we all need to be paying particular attention to. Inequality is something that we need to be paying particular attention to. But in 2010, something really, really terrible happened. Right? What really happened that was so awful in 2010 is women didn't vote. The, 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 the voting participation of women in 2010 compared to, to 2008 plummeted. That was the word used by the pollster, Celinda Lake. And as a result, uh, you have the women didn't vote in 2010, and Citizens United allowed corporations to flood money into the, into the elections. And what we have is Tea Party uh, extremists streaming into the United States Congress and into state legislatures. 
And what does the United States Congress do the first thing they do? H.R. 1, that's the legislation to fund the government in the beginning of 2011. One of the key provisions of H.R. 1 was to defund the all Title X family planning clinics, mm -hmm. zero out their funding, mm -hmm. zero it out, which is a public health nightmare. What are these people thinking? H.R. 3, the third most important piece of legislation that John Boehner could think about was H.R. 3, which prevented all public funding and all private insurance coverage of abortion care. And make no mistake, yeah, one, one in three women will have an abortion in their lifetime. It is a necessary and a common aspect of women's reproductive health. Um, uh, they, they then went on to put in the Blunt Amendment, which would restrict birth control, right? <laughs> this is just, it's just crazy. There was no support, meanwhile, for Jan Schakowsky's jobs bill, which actually was focused not only on putting uh, men back to work, but also putting women back to work and providing money to the state and local governments that had been laying off public sector workers who are disproportionately women, right? No support for the Jan Schakowsky jobs bill. Where is the support for VAWA, as Avis has said? And, and, uh, and, and instead what we see is this, this relentless support for more tax breaks for corporations and, and more tax breaks for millionaires and millionaires. Okay, so now we hear people like Ann Romney and uh, Nikki Haley of South Carolina saying, oh gosh, there's really no war in women. Women really care about the economy. Yes, we do. That is exactly why women are deserting the Republican Party in droves. And let me just end with a final thought. Actually, to have the Republican Party go so far off the rails when it comes to women's well-being is not good for women because they are scoring significant policy successes that hurt us all. It's also not good for the women's movement. We need a vibrant political scene where we can go to either party to promote our, our needs and our interests. And, and with the Republican Party as badly off the rails as it is right now, the entire movement uh, will struggle. So I'm hoping that we can get, uh, that, that we can uh, help, help those moderates in the Republican Party to uh, take back their party. Uh, which would be very good. In the meantime, my organization is, uh, is, is hoping to um, uh, get the following women into the Senate. Here's the good news. We've got Tammy Baldwin running for the United States Senate in Wisconsin, uh, Maisie Hirano in Hawaii, Elizabeth Warren in, in Massachusetts, Shelley Berkeley in uh, Nevada. We've got a lot of women that are running for office, and, and we're going to be having their backs and trying to get them into office and chase these Tea Party extremists out. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Carol McDonald and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Planned Parenthood um, and I am honored to be here and, and uh, definitely feel the love um, in the room. Um, so I, I think it's always, when I address the crowd, it's always worth reminding people what Planned Parenthood is, who we are, and what we do because that seems to be our opponent's favorite thing to do is to distort uh, those facts. Um, so many of you know that uh, we have 800 health centers across the country because we are first and foremost a primary health care provider. Um, and in fact, I would love for you to raise your hand if you have been to a Planned Parenthood or know someone who has been to a Planned Parenthood. All right, I think that speaks volumes. That to me says it all because that's almost everyone in this room. Um, we serve in our health centers over three million people every year. And this is a number that, that continues to astound me. So online, on our, um, uh, where, uh, for people seeking health information, we get over 33 million visits to our website of people seeking health information. Um, so when people go after Planned Parenthood, they're going after basic, basic health care. I want to talk a little bit about the services that we provide, because again, we seem to be um, our opponent's favorite punching bag lately. Um, so when they go after Planned Parenthood, I want you to know exactly what they're trying to take away. We are talking about breast exams, um, as if particularly the black community, but women in general don't have enough problems with breast cancer. They're taking away breast exams. They're taking away cervical cancer screenings. And I just learned that black women are twice as likely to die 
than any other population from, breath, from cervical cancer. So we are talking about matters of life and death here. Um, we are talking about access to birth control, to affordable birth control. We are talking about access to pregnancy screenings, to pregnancy tests, to screenings for HIV. We know the ravages of HIV and AIDS in our community um, and other STI screenings. So we're talking basic health care that saves our lives. I want to talk a little bit about our patients because I think there may be a misconception about who our patients are. And I would love to set the record straight about that. 14% of our patients are African American, 25% of our patients are Latina, 74% of our patients live at 150% or lower um, of the federal poverty level. So these are low income people, low income women and men um, that come to us for, um, for health care. For many of those people, we are the only interaction that they have with the health care system. We are on the front lines every day. So when people talk about taking away Planned Parenthood, I know they always want to talk about abortion. I'm going to get to that in a second. But we are talking about basic, life-saving health care, and sometimes the only health care that people get. And what I just described to you is well over 90% of what we do. 90% of what we do is basic, preventative, reproductive health care. I want to talk about that other, that other part, though, because that seems to also be in the news. We are a provider of safe, high-quality, um, compassionate abortion care, non-judgmental. When people come into our health centers and they come into our clinics, it is a conversation. And we work with people through that process, and we will support their decision whichever way they decide to go. Um, and that is something that is um, it's so fundamental and so sacred. We can talk all day long about the higher rates of abortion in this country, which is an issue. Um, and it is an issue because people like access to care, they like access to information, and if we can address that, if we can bridge that disparity, then maybe we can talk about, then maybe we can reduce the numbers um, of abortions, but we will never, we will never walk away from our commitment to making sure that that option for women is always available, is always safe, and that it is compassionate care that they receive. <laughs> and it's ironic that we, that, that Planned Parenthood was invited to speak on a political panel because none of what I described should be political. Because this is medical, this is basic health care and medicine for women. So it should not even be in this political arena. However, understanding the landscape that we work in, and all of the panelists have described that so accurately, the attacks on, uh, on access to abortion, the attacks on access to birth control, the, uh, the attacks on women in general that we have, it just seems to have amped up over the past year and a half. Um, we have become politically stronger, and we'll continue to do so. We will continue to engage. We will continue to support candidates who support access to all of the services that I just described. And we will go after, let me be very clear about that. We will go after anyone who thinks that women should deserve anything less than what I just described. We are talking about reproductive health, and for the most part, we are talking about women's health, but that is not to leave the brothers out, because if anything, if anything that we are seeing in our health centers, the greatest um, growth in our patient population is from men, particularly African-American men, and what I love when I travel around the country is when I go to rallies and we talk about these things, is the brothers that show up, the men who are there, standing hand in hand, side by side with the women. We know, we know that when women are healthier, our families are healthier, our communities are healthier. So I am so, I'm so honored that you invited us to be here. Planned Parenthood is, uh, is stands side by side with all of you at the National Action Network to be a part of the solution. I know that we're going to talk about what are some of the action steps that we can take. Um, clearly, this is a political panel, so one of the biggest actions is going to be around that special date in November um, um, this year. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for the love, for the support.
support, and we are only going to grow stronger, and it's going to be with your help. So thank you.
afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me go last after all these brilliant women. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't um, first give an appreciation to Reverend Sharpton, Tamika, Janae, uh, Melanie uh, for, for having me here. And I also want to shout out uh, to Mark Thompson in the back, who's been such a great mentor to me. Uh, very happy to see you all here. Uh, I really don't have much to say because these women did such a fantastic job, but I do want to tell you a quick story uh, about a relationship that I was in and that uh, has really impacted my life. Um, in, uh, in 2004, uh, I was in a relationship with a man who told me how wonderful I was and, and told me so many great stories about how he was going to help my life and help change my community. And he told me how much he loved kids because he knew I loved kids and he uh, told me that he wanted to make sure no child was left behind. <laughs> but in reality, uh, it, it, a lot of kids were left behind because there were some unfunded mandates that were made that did not actually help the young people in my community get the education they needed. And then this man also told me uh, how important it was uh, to help make sure that I was economically stable, but yet and still this man continued to give tax breaks to the wealthy instead of helping me out. And so I found myself in 2008 in a position where I needed to get, to get out of this bad relationship. <laughs> and lo and behold, the time was perfect because another fine <laughs> man came by and he told me that I could have change in my life. This man showed me what hope looks like. He told me that I could have a, a better economic situation, that I could actually have health care. And not just health care for me, but health care for seven million more African Americans. And so I began to date this man, and I've been dating him now for three years. And it's been a great relationship. But this man doesn't just talk about it, he shows me in the actions that he actually cares about me. So this man has been able to show me that he wants me to be a, a strong small business owner. And not just me, but my community as well. And so I saw that with his investments of over $3.4 billion to help strengthen African-American businesses, that he wants me to be able to stand on my two feet. But also, by making sure that we had tax credits and tax breaks like the, the, child, care, um, the child tax credit, which is actually helping many people, not just those who are middle class, but those who are trying to get into the middle class, to be able to uh, afford to have our children uh, be raised and, and, and have an opportunity to succeed in this country. And so uh, I am very fortunate to be in this relationship with this man, but it is coming up on our anniversary. <laughs> Asian-Americans, Pacific Islanders, 
to wake up on November 7th and have a new slash old way of doing things back in the White House. So I, I am again appreciative of this time and I look forward to further dialogue. Um, get from each of you, if you have advice to the folks who are watching uh, this, who are here in this audience, what can they do to get more engaged with these issues? You know, I cover a lot of campaigns, I go to uh, and, and cover these events, and you often see a lot of women in the audience, uh, you see them passing out buttons. The mass of women in the United States Congress, you would not see votes in the United States Senate to restrict birth control. Get more women in, in, in elected office. Eli, I know you deal with young people. What do you hear from, from, from young women in terms of engagement and, and how can you talk to them about wanting to get more engaged? Um, I think it's, it's always about infrastructure and, and maintaining what infrastructure exists. Um, I just renewed my membership to NCNW. Uh, it's a commitment that I've made, right? So as a, as a young person, I'm a fellow, I'm a student, and I'm a fellow of the Black and Vote. And one of the things that we do just this past weekend we trained 36 youth on how to go out and register people to vote and engage in their communities. And it's all about funding. How they, and, and funneling people, how did uh, Stephanie's ex-boyfriend get to where he got? Because he was funneled there. He was, he was given opportunities from when he was a toddler all the way through Yale, where he halfway got out, but he got out, and he got into office. How do you do that? There was a structure there for him to flow through. If you have water and you don't have anywhere for it to move, it's going to be all over the place. So for young people, you have to create and maintain that structure. The problem with 2010 isn't that women just up and decided not to vote. No, they didn't put any funding into the infrastructure. So what happened, people didn't get out. So it's a matter of having consistent and well-maintained and well-funded structures for our young people to come through and succeed through. And uh, the, the, the first and, and last black female senator was Carol Posey Braun. Uh, is there somebody else coming up in the pipeline? If not, uh, how do you address that? You know, it, it is ridiculous that the last black person in the Senate period is our current president. Uh, and you're right, in terms of black female representation, not any better actually in terms of our numbers in there. Uh, it's ridiculous. The main thing that I want to get out there about building that infrastructure in terms of that farm team of those future elected officials is that number one, we have to be able to go out there and put our names on the ballot. It doesn't have to start with the Senate, it can start with the school board, it can start with the city council, then it can move up to the state legislature and move on up. We need that farm team. You know, especially with women, oftentimes we talk ourselves out of running for office because we think we don't have the qualifications. There's a lot of studies on this, but basically, interestingly, it boils down to the fact that men always think they're qualified, even if they're not, and women don't think they're qualified, even if we're abundantly qualified. So go out there, do what you need to do, and believe in yourself, and when you see that individual running for office, we need to get up with the money and support them. We need to support our candidates with money, with time, and make sure that we have that pipeline and start that going. That's exactly what we need, more political representation, specifically among black women, but also among all women in the black community generally. Gloria? Yeah, I have, a, I have a similar point. It's like we do very well in terms of training grassroots organizers and leaders to be voices who can knock on the doors of policymakers. But what we haven't been able to do is reconceptualize ourselves and think of ourselves as policymakers and able to take that extra step. So I think a lot of it is self-perception. Um, you know, we have the Asian American Pacific Islander community has 25 uh, congressional challengers this year. Um, not many are women, but out of the um, viable group, men, actually half of them are over half of them are women. So that goes to your point about the fact that you know women are overqualified and don't think that they could actually do it. So once they convince themselves, we actually get the cream of the crop. So this is a good place to start. Uh, Stephanie, you got another story to tell? Very 
important that we understand um, how significant the role of black women uh, is in our families and our communities. Mm -hmm. And as we go, so do others behind us. Um, and so it's important that we have uh, that responsibility shown everywhere we are. So for the campaign specifically, uh, we're gonna start going after American Women Empowerment Summits because we wanna have women in the room to help us shape what we're gonna do in the communities um, and help us shape the agenda of how we're gonna get our families involved to the polls. Um, it's, it, all of us can do something. And it, it doesn't matter if you have four minutes or you have 44 hours to, to give, uh, it's important that we all uh, understand that we have a responsibility to make sure our president gets back to us. talked about the Tea Party, and the thing that I, was interesting to me, I was working on the Hill um, during the time when Congressman Lewis um, was heckled and uh, Congressman, now chairman of the CBC, Emmanuel Cleaver, was spat upon, um, and uh, was just amazed to see the, the disrespect and the rage uh, that was distorting the faces of the people that were wronging our walls. Um, and what I took away from that is, when you hear, we've got to take our country back, we have really got to say, this is our country too. Yeah. Um, and what that conveys is, we have ownership stake in what's happening uh, in the federal government and the local government. And I watched each summer as the field trips in the spring for white Americans, particularly uh, conservative white Americans, was to take their children to the hill and show them these people work for you. We must do that with our children. I'm very encouraged by, I know we're all very encouraged by the MLK Memorial finally being opened on the mall. And it's beautiful to see the pickup and black traffic on the mall as a result. Um, let's take it from the memorial straight up the street to the congressional buildings and the Senate buildings. These people work for you. You are their constituent. You don't have to make an appointment. You can go in there and say, we are from the district, we want to speak with the senator, we want to speak with the member of Congress. Whether or not they do that is up to them, but there will be somebody there you can speak to. And whether or not you are agreed with, if you are present, squeaky wheel, uh, they will have to deal with you. And we didn't want to have to deal with the Tea Party in our office, but we had no choice because they were there every day, all day, for a long time. One bus trip up is not going to be enough. Right. So I just encourage all of us to, uh, so often, unfortunately, the way we react, and, and this is not just about the black community, but I think progressive community in general, when we get disgusted with the political process and debate, we just withdraw from it. If you look at the Occupy Wall Street movement, so much of the potential there is in what they could do if they seize the political power uh, that um, would be manifested by their rage. And instead, um, I think we're all still waiting to see if that's going to happen, or if they're going to not vote. In which case, as you said, we'll be in that bad relationship again. Um, so we need to make sure that we translate our, our thinking, our passion, our anger, whatever it is that motivates us, um, into a sustained uh, connection with those who are running our country. The only thing I want to add to what's already been said about um, getting women to run for office um, and sort of the difference in dynamic between women and men is if you know a woman, if you see a sister that's out there that is powerful, that has leadership qualities, then ask her to run. A lot of times women need to be asked. Men step up and do, but if you ask a woman to run, she is that much more likely to then start that process. So if you see talent out there, and I'm sure, I am sure, there is a lot of talent sitting right here in this room, right here in this room, you know, look at the system that you see that's really powerful and say, I want you to run. Will you please run for office? Thank you. So we're going to take questions. So, hi everyone, I'm Janae Ingram, I'm the DC Bureau Chief for National Action Network. Um, as we start to move into the question and answer portion, I would just like to first remind everyone that we do have a second component to this panel that will go more on the social issues. One of the things that we haven't talked about is fair pay, and I, and I know that Amy might jump into that, uh, Amy Matsui with the National Women's Law, Law Center. Um, so as you ask your questions, just remember that this is a discussion and we should be focusing on solutions. So questions away. <laughs> <laughs> 
we're all brilliant, but none of us are actually there. We came over the floor, right? So, so what she's saying is how do we take what we're saying here and add that component of changing the structure that exists so that it would it would never make sense for a young woman to go through college and have a hundred thousand dollars of debt once finished. How can we change that structure of funneling corporate money when you look where you see you know we're attacking Alec? How can we change that structure of, of Walmart giving to Alec and then Alec giving to a political party or political person who does not support our beliefs and our ideas? So where how do we come together with that component? And I think that it really just speaks to building that infrastructure and funneling people in to positions of power that can make those decisions, that can stand on the floor of the house and wear a hoodie and say this is wrong and we're going to change the laws and we're going to change the way we make the laws so that you can't you can't do a line item you know you can't you can't add more back here. No, you're going to have to do everything up front. You're going to have to do everything through a legitimate process that is of the people and for the people and by the people. There's a lot I could uh, say, and I'm sure that you understand that we're not always all in agreement on the same issues. And so I would like to know what um, you all are doing, especially Planned Parenthood, to survey women to really know what women's issues are, because that's how it's been addressed. From my perspective, um, Planned Parenthood could also be social media uh, billboards with some closed links. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, in terms of um, the, the question about gauging um, people's response um, around our issues, we are actually, and we will be unveiling this later this year, we have undergone a massive survey um, and research, A, on, um, on all of the different research that has been done on women's issues over the past 40 years, as well as identifying what gaps there are in the information that we have. Um, I think if you look at, um, you know, I, mean, I, I think the, the second part of your question gets a little bit out of judgment on behavior, and that is just as an organization and as a healthcare provider, not the business that we're in. We are not here to judge behavior. We are here to provide healthcare. And we are here to provide people with the information that they need to make healthy, informed decisions. So that's who we are as an organization. Um, you know, we we talk a lot about, about about the health services. What I failed to mention is that we also have over a million people who come through our education services. We are out there in the community. We are in schools. We are in churches, providing health information and education. Um, and I think that is one way where we interact with young people. We actually have peer educators who talk to other young people, other teenagers, um, about sexual health, reproductive health, and just healthy relationships and, um, and information like that. And I think that when we, what, what we have found, and this is not just an opinion, this is actually research-based, when you arm people with comprehensive information, our programs are abstinence-based because we also know and research shows that delaying sexual activity is, produces better outcomes, better health outcomes for our youngsters. But we can say abstinence alone, all day long. We know, research shows, that that doesn't work. And so we have to, it is, it is, it, it's not just an opinion, it is a moral imperative to make sure that people are, and our youngsters in particular, are armed with all the information that they need to make healthy decisions, and that is a commitment that we will always stand by. And in terms of public opinion, that is actually very, very popular. Terry, did you want to quickly say something? I, I really do, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, sexuality is a fundamental and important part of the human experience, and, and preventing pregnancy is, is a basic part of women's preventive health care as a result, and we, and we just can't lose sight of that. Think back to the day when women did not have access okay. to reliable contraception, right? They had 12 and 15 and 20 pregnancies and childbirths in their lifetime, and they lived sicker than women do today, and they died younger than women do today. So we need to support them. So at this time, I think, uh, if we're ready, we're going to turn bring up the other set of panelists um, to talk about the the more social uh, empowerment. First of all, let's thank the panelists that we have up here right now. It's been a great conversation.
and we could talk all day. Um, and then also we want to thank Nia Malika Henderson, the National Political Director for the Washington Post, for being with us all day. Thank you so much, Nia. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to have the next.